Hi everyone. Today I am with David Snowden, Welsh academic, consultant and researcher in the field of knowledge management. He is the founder and chief scientific officer of Cognitive Edge, a consulting and research network focusing on complexity theory in sense making. His award-winning Harvard Business Review article, A Leader's Framework for Decision Making, introduced us to the Kenevan Framework, which helps leaders determine the prevailing operative context so they can make appropriate choices. Now, recently in Ericsson, I've had the pleasure of working with Cognitive Edge on probably the first ever complexity analysis of Net Promoter, NPS. Now, Dave, before we get into NPS, um, there are some there are some terms there that are being used, like complexity theory and sense making. Could you just explain what is complexity theory and why is it so important and, and different and for customer experience people to understand? Okay, and complexity theory is about 40 or 50 years old, although it's millions of years old in practice. Yeah. Um, it starts with the physicist Prigogine. Um, he realizes that there's a huge difference between a closed system and an open system. So as a system becomes open to multiple interactions with multiple people with multiple things, every outcome becomes inherently uncertain. So the way I often explain it to people, it's you know, rather like you've got a, a big ring of magnets and in the middle of the magnets you've got some big iron disks. And all of the magnets are continuously changing so you can never predict where the disks will actually sit. Yes. Yeah, so the inherent uncertainty I think is probably the key aspect of complexity. The good news is there's a science behind it. We can measure the dispositions of a complex system. So we can say it's likely to go in this direction, it's not likely to go in that direction, even though we can't predict an outcome. Yes, because that, that's kind of interesting because most of uh, customer experience when they measure assume root cause effects and assume that it's almost like an engineering paradigm, um, that the fact that you can measure, you get data, and it's uh, predictable of a model. I think every single, whether it's customer effort score, satisfaction, net promoter, all seem to follow that sort of paradigm. But what you seem to be saying is that that is wrong and, and um, customer experience is more complex than that and therefore they should do something different. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, far more complex. And I think you also then miss the opportunities. If you know, We've done a lot of work, for example, in the development sector before we did the MPS work. If you understand where people sit at the moment and you can influence the direction of their travel, that's actually much more likely to produce a good outcome unless you try and force them into a predicted endpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reality is things are constantly changing. You know, you haven't got predictive systems. Yes. And the unit of measurement, obviously, within uh, all these customer experience measurement tools is that the human mind. Um, so you are you sort of saying that perception is inherently complex. So any sort of measurement process, whether it's we want to see how people feel about or think or feel about going to the store or whether that's going on a website is inherently uncertain and needs to follow complexity principles when we measure it. Generally, yes, because you're talking about human attitudes and beliefs, and those are profoundly influenced by day-to-day -day conversations, which you can't control. Mm -hmm. So an ability you know, to understand in real time what's going on and do very small interventions to influence things is actually a much lower energy cost and, and much more effective. Okay. okay. It's, um, another term that was being used was sense-making, um, and I think the yeah. sense-maker is the tool that you use to measure. Could you just describe sense making and how sense maker works? Different people define it. I define sense making as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. So with that comes a concept of sufficiency. How do we know enough in order to take action? Mm -hmm. And that's actually really important in understanding customers because if you wait for survey results, you can end up missing an opportunity to influence things for the better or deal with a problem. So sense making is is geared into opening up people's perceptions so they see things that they don't expect to see and then helping them to act accordingly. Okay. So to give you an example on quite a few projects, we found that the way people interpret their stories is actually positive. But the way that machine algorithms and um, suppliers interpret them is negative. Yes. Um, so you, people are just making an awful lot of, of dangerous assumptions and they're missing opportunities as a result. Yes. Because, of course, the, the, the real-time text, text vendors, the Enterprise Feedback Management Center, 
they would say, well, we do real time. We, we, we do this already. And uh, we can manage mass data streams and we need that text algorithm to chunk the data to come up with results. How do, how do you differ practically from that approach? Well, we think it's useful, um, and we use those sort of tools within it. But what what is written down is maybe about four or five percent at most of what people know. Yes. So anything which depends on text is limited. And um, also, and I'll sort of mix around between the two questions here. What we do with SenseMaker is we capture narrative, and we capture it in any form in any language. It can be pictures or drawings, as much as it has to be text. Okay. In fact, often people find it easier to take a picture than to write a story. But then what happens, and this is unique to us and patented, is we continually, yeah, every user who tells a story then interprets their own story. The power of interpretation goes to the user, yeah, to the, 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 the customer, not to a computer algorithm or an expert. And there's, there's another bit of cognitive science there which is key. Human language evolved from abstractions, not from naming things. Yes. And words name things, so again, they're more limited. So we move back to that level of abstraction, and we catch underlying attitudes or beliefs. And what happens is that people add layers of meaning to the original text. They don't necessarily interpret the text. Mm -hmm. So where we've done controlled tests, for example, and four or five of these for the UN, we've taken stories told and indexed by girls in Ethiopia, for example, or Roma kids in um, Eastern Europe. Then we presented those to experts and to computer algorithms and got them to interpret it the way they think the kids would have interpreted it. And it's radically different. Yes. Not only is it radically different, it's much more narrow. Mm -hmm. When the children or, the, or the, the customers interpret their stories, they open up more possibilities for intervention. Okay. Um, is it, I guess there's an effort thing behind it, though. With a text algorithm, you can chunk data very quickly. Millions of pieces of text that come through. Does this take a lot more effort to analyze the data and come up with results? Not really, because two or three things. First of all, the, the initial analysis is done by the person who put the data in, so that okay. doesn't cost you anything. Yeah? Yes. But then what you do is your analysts play around with the data, rather like, like data analytics play around with algorithms. Once you've got patterns, you can actually build cockpits. So we have well on safety, for example, which basically is like a contour map. Yeah, where the dense contours indicate attitudes. Yes. Now, what's interesting on that, and I obviously can't tell the client, is there are two dense contours at the moment. One is rule compliance and the other is job completion, and they're completely opposite. You, you can't do both. Now, that means that can be visually changing in real time, and each factory can have their own version of it. So you stop okay. doing big programs to try and make everybody healthy and safer and you start to shift them to a sustainable next stage. That's the sort of, how would we tell more stories like this and fewer stories like that intervention? Yes. So for example, in a call center, if you've got SenseMaker input, you haven't just got a number that people have got to try and change. You've got narrative linked to the numbers, and then you say, what would we do to create more like this, fewer like that? Yes. You're more likely to get sustainable customer response. And this is really interesting because um, you're, Sounds to me like you're working on the disposition of the system, not in traditional ways of doing it, the dry analytics and the root cause. So you're not saying here, if we do this intervention, it's going to have X effect on ROI. You're changing the whole system and trying to move it like you were speaking about the magnets, which sounds very yeah. different from traditional dry analytics ROI approach. Have I got that right? Yeah, you have, and if that actually that gives companies the opportunity to avoid the sort of catastrophic two to three year cycle of success and failure. Yeah? Right. It also yeah. allows people to be much more nuanced in their response because they can use the customer stories back in their marketing. And you can even get to the point some of the panel base work we're currently doing in transport, for example, which basically allows the customers to interact with stories from other customers. So yes. you're measuring the interactions between human beings who are social and understanding how that influences your product. Yes. You're not assuming it's all a root cause into one individual rational choice because human beings aren't like that. Now, the obvious question that a lot of people will say is, I'm sitting in the boardroom and they're asking, what's the ROI of doing this? I mean, the regular, there's often articles saying, what's the ROI on net promoter score? What's the ROI on customer experience? If someone's to ask you the question, Dave, what, we want to put this in place, what's, what's our ROI on doing this thing? What would your response be? Because I know that's traditional thinking, but 
it needs to be maybe framed in a different no, way. I think, yeah, ROI is fine. I mean, I, I would I'd answer two ways to that. One is if you, if you think there's an ROI to understand your customers better, then the better you understand it, the better the results. Yeah. 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 So we get much closer to real understanding, and we're you're much more able to intervene to get a benefit. So we share the ROI question with more traditional techniques. Yes. But I think the other thing we found is that the ability to engage all customer facing staff in real time with something they understand rather than a survey box or a black box. Data analytics tends to be a black box, whereas this you can trace back from the index into the stories and see how it built. Yes. So you could probably argue you probably save about ooh, 10 to 15 percent of your corporate internal communication bill. And you probably increase the response to customer positives and negatives by a factor of weeks. Now, it's not difficult to get a good ROI, ROI out of that. Now, another term that was used in my intro was Kinefin. Could you maybe just explain yeah. what Kinefin is and how it helps in decision making? Kinefin is a Welsh word. Um, it, it literally translates as habitat or place, but that's not what it means in Welsh. It, it means the place of your multiple belongings. Um, it's a sense of being rooted in many different paths, which profoundly influence what you are, but of which you can only ever be partially aware. So it's a really good name for a model yes. or a framework, rather, based on complex adaptive systems. So what Kinevin does, and you know, we can actually do this real-time mapping for the narrative, it identifies five states. Um, two states where there are repeating relationships between cause and effect, where you can use engineering approaches, where data analytics can be really useful. Um, one where the relationships are obvious and the other where they're complicated and require analysis. So those two domains cover most of existing practice. Um, but then it identifies the complex space and that's where you do small safe to fail interventions in parallel more more fewer stories like this more stories like that you're constantly experimenting with the system to influence this direction and responding accordingly so that, that's far more resilient yes. and the fourth domain is chaos uh, if that's entered accidentally it's a crisis um, but we also use it for a thing called wisdom of crowds chaos means there are no constraints there's no limitations so, if, for example, in one of the cases where we built a panel of respondents, so people are telling stories continuously out throughout a transport experience, we can then ask a marketing question of them in real time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And we can get all of them to score something independently of each other, so we have objectivity in the results. Okay. So you're moving from a, a traditional marketing commission surveys, get surveys, decide what to do, into continuous panels, and then the ability to interact with those panels in real time. So that, that's the use of the chaos space. And then disorder, the fifth domain, is the state of not knowing which of the others you're in. Now, the, the great power of Kinevin, and the thing which makes it unique, is it says most of the things you're currently doing are right. They're just right within boundaries. Mm -hmm. And for the last 30 years, we've had management fads, net promoter scores are the latest, which mm -hmm. basically claim to do everything. And what Kinevin says is all of these things have value, but you need to understand the nature of the system they were designed to deal with. Yes. So would you say it's fair to say that customer experience is in that complex domain and therefore needs safe to fail experiments first? Most of it, yeah. The, the stuff which has high value. Uh, I'm dealing with, for example, with outages on, on mobile phone provision and things like that become complicated or obvious. Yes. yes. Yeah, and there you have got repeatable relationships. But all of the stuff to do with outage recommendation, like, you know, like the project we did for you, where we found yes. there was a huge difference yes. between whether it was a relative or a friend or a stranger who asked the question. And those are the sort of subtleties we get out, and those are complex. Fantastic. Which is a good segue into the uh, net promoter work that we did. Um, before we talk about the work Ericsson had done with you in uh, looking at and understanding net promoter score using SenseMaker and these complexity techniques, can you just give a, you've written a little bit about NPS um, in, in the market. What's your view of net promoter NPS? I think it's a good example of Goodhart's law. Um, in economics, I'll give you Stratham's variation. It says the minute a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a measure. Right, right. So yeah. what we actually had is a few really good papers which showed that if you asked the, would you recommend this, you had a correlation with performance. So yes. it was a good measure. Then people made a target and you've got desperate managers trying to get people to move a Likard scale from their customers. Yes. Yeah, so, and I think that's, that's where we had a problem. So what we're doing is 
asking people for a story rather than from a, a, a description rather than an evaluation, then getting them to interpret it through a series of abstractions so that they become far more descriptive about their experience. So effectively then the measure can become a measure again uh, rather than distorting target. And it also makes managers' life easier. It's not how the hell do I move this Likard scale, but how will I get more like this and fewer like that? But your target therefore is more stories like this, fewer stories like that. So it's still yeah. a target there. Yeah, it is, and we call them vector targets. This is work we're doing for the UN and World Bank. Right. Uh, vectors measure direction and speed. Mm -hmm. And it's much more effective. Are we moving in the right, the right direction at right, the right speed? Is an ecological, not an engineering approach, but it is as empirical, in fact, is as quantitative. And if you look at, I think one of the great things we've done with SenseMaker is in traditionally a qualitative approach is now a quantitative field, and that, that makes it more objective. Yes. It comes up, this almost comes back to this notion of disposition again, rather than yeah. root cause. And I remember the analogy with an aircraft wing, and hopefully I got this right, a little crack in the aircraft which shows its disposition maybe to break. Um, rather than yeah. you know, going straight for root cause all the time. So maybe managers should be thinking more about parameter targets or vector targets, looking at the disposition in real time. Is that essentially... Yeah, just, key... all right, I've just come back from doing safety work and um, attitudinal work in the electrical industry in South Africa, which is a chronic case of sort of things you've illustrated, Yeah. where attitudes of engineers are more important than rule compliance in terms of safety and service provision. Yeah, which is kind of like where we can gather data. Yes. But it's the same in hospitals. We can now trigger alerts to nursing staff to say that the disposition of the system towards abuse of elderly patients, for example, has reached the point where it needs intervention. So you stop trying to forecast the future, but you forecast dispositional states. In a big covert project, we got the Arab Spring about two months early. Mm. Because not we could forecast it would happen, but we could say the dispositions of the narrative landscapes are such yeah, that although it appears stable, the underlying mathematics indicates high levels of instability, so for one small event will create a catastrophic failure. And before I go on to a little bit more on the NPS work we do, I do have to ask you this question. Um, there's a lot of mission statements and brand comments, and we want to be the most trusted provider, or we want to be the best network in, in, a, in a technology. Are you saying those sort of almost ideals are, should be thrown in the bin and we actually have no ideals and just follow a dispositional st state or are you saying something? Well, they, they can be useful to give a general sense of direction and given that they're generally loose assemblies of platitudes that's all they could do anyway. Um, right. So having a sense of direction is a good idea. We, we, we tend to use two things more than that. The one is heuristics or rules of thumb. Yes. Um, to govern customer behavior under conditions of uncertainty and those, those are measurable. Uh, and the other one is we use parable form stories. If you look at the world religions, none of them have mission statements, none of them have clear communication strategies. They all use paradoxical stories which shift people in the right direction. And, and we, we use that approach as well. Now come back to the net promoter work. We did with Ericsson, a comprehensive exercise. Uh, we did it in India in the telecommunications market. Um, what are the key things from that project that stand out for you, that demonstrate the value of SenseMaker and more stories like this, fewer stories like that, and understanding net promoter score or any other score, to be honest with you, it just happened to be net promoter from this the, the, this complexity point of view. Well, I haven't got the report in front of me, but um, I think there were two or three things which were really important. First of all, we allowed people to start with an ex with an experience, so effectively they, we cognitively activated their brains around an experience. Yes. And then we allowed them to interpret that experience descriptively, not evaluatively. Yes. And the trouble with evaluative descriptions on Likard scales is people go on to autom automatic pilot. Yes. Uh, we give them, for example, three positive labels on a triangle, which engages a different part of the brain. They now have to think more deeply about where to place things. Mm -hmm. So we, we get weighting factors, which you don't normally get with a Likard scale, which, which aids product mix decisions, for example. Mm -hmm. I say we saw some interesting stuff on yours. The fact that people interpreted stories negatively when the customers didn't. The fact that they actually had different ways or focuses on recommendation dependent on the level of contact they had with the individual. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the sort of things when you look at them, you, that makes a lot of sense. You would never get them out of a traditional survey because it's hypothesis based. Yes. Yeah, and this this is a non hypothesis based approach. So you go in open, you discover yes. novelty, and there were four or five examples of that. 
So essentially, with traditional survey, uh, you're, you're you're giving them a pre-can list of questions you want them to ask, and people will gift a response or they will answer that. But in actual fact, if you leave it open, let you tell your story, it may be more of a modulator effect, but it's more honest and valid to the individual. Got it. And yeah. it gives you more intervention possibilities, so you can actually see novel ways, whereas if you just present hypothesis questions, then you just confirm or deny your current attitude. And remember, I'm going to give a basic figure. If we give a bunch of radiologists a set of x-rays and ask them to look for cancer nodules, and in one of the x-rays we hide a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, 83% um, of the radiologists don't see it, even though they're isolated. Yes. Now, you think about traditional okay. customer relationships, think about how many opportunities have been missed. Yes. Yeah? And we build systems which throw outliers into people's faces so they have to look at them yeah, and okay. pay attention to them. I mean, some of the things that I noted on, on the NPS work that we did um, was um, an interesting thing I found was the fact that um, the traditional characteristics of detractors and promoters, so people would give a 9 or a 10, but in actual fact, we unpacked it and found that a third of those people who gave a 9 and 10 would actively or partially state they would never, ever recommend the company. Yeah. So there's a disconnect. And likewise That's with detractors, there's a softness to it. Uh, I may give a naught to six, but do I really mean I'd never recommend? Well, actually, fact, two thirds didn't mean that. So there's this nature within scales that maybe a lot of people don't realize that it's almost, I think your word was an autonomic response. People may give you a yeah. score, but they don't actually mean it. Yeah, or they, or they may just have flipped over, just carried on with the same scoring pattern. And the same yeah. is true with, with data analytics. I mean, it can do a huge amount of stuff, but it still relies on words being used consistently in, in the same context, and then they aren't in humans. Yes, yes. And I understand. I mean, the other cool thing from our point of view is we capture any language. Yes. Because we analyze based on the metadata, not on the story. The story is an expl yes. explanation. So that allows you to go into multicultural situations at significantly lower cost. So you're starting with the, the quants. Well, you get the, the human yeah. intervention at the beginning, you quantify it, and you only look at the stories at the end that are relevant based on that quantification. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, technically the stories are in explain them as an explanation for a statistical pattern. Yes. And, and that, that is more persuasive because if people start to read stories, they form an impression and they only see things that support that impression in the subsequent stories. So we mitigate that a lot. And another thing I found was you're using this concept of hunches because I guess so often in a traditional view, hunches are almost considered irrelevant or outliers are thrown in the bin, but you're actually Which keeping is a pity, that. Really. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's called, it's called abductive logic. Um, yeah. And human beings evolved to think abductively because it means we spot opportunities. Yes. I mean, the issue is how do you objective make abductive leaps objective? And we do that like the wisdom of crowds things I talk by being able to pull yes. back to your customers. If 500 customers signify something in a certain way, then you got an objective feedback. Yes. And I think. For an intuition. And I think for me, these are all uh, perhaps the, the complexity term is slightly unfortunate because we didn't find it complex actually it's uh, as a tool it's very no, simple we, 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 we say complexity is the new simplicity um, <laughs> the, the trouble is it, it it's so different from the very complicated things people have produced it takes some time to discover how simple it is again i use a lot of metaphors they think it's like managing your children yeah, you don't set your children objectives or ask them to assess you on a scale of one to ten as to would would they recommend you as parents to you know somebody else. Yeah, yeah. You constantly interact with them and you influence their direction. They influence you. And as a product supplier, you want what is called coevolution. You want your product to influence their needs. Their needs to influence your product. It's this dynamic real-time feedback loop. It's, it's it's organic. It's like maintaining an ecosystem. So let me give you a practical scenario. If I was tasked as a customer experience director, my boss has told me, got me in a room and said, your role is to improve NPS by, from where it is now at zero to plus 20 in a, a year, let's say. How would you respond to, to that boss? And, you know, the scenario is one where it's boss versus employee. So there's obviously there's a little bit of, ooh, how, how, do I just give in and say, yes, sir? Or how would you respond to that? Actually, I got asked that question two weeks ago in South Africa, so I'll give the same response. Yeah? Okay. Um, what we're doing there is we're going to recruit a panel of 10% of travelers on one yeah. transport system, 
um, which is a simple web advert in the test here. So we'll get a panel. Those people will store, tell stories as they enter and leave the, the transport system and at any time they feel nervous. Yeah? yeah. And that data will be available in real time, but it includes the MPS recommendation score. Yeah? Okay. So within a month, I've got real time data coming in rather than the survey at significantly lower cost than the traditional capture. Yeah? Okay. Okay. But it also means I can now go to staff and say, look, we got these stories, you know, this pattern, what, you know, what do you think we did wrong? And what can we do to do more like this and you know, get more stories like this and fewer stories like that? So I can start real time interaction with the staff. So my MPS score starts to improve in real time. Okay. I can also take risks, small experiments, see if it works, if it doesn't try something else. Yes. But the whole point about this approach is you move very quickly. It's a new form of panels. It's real time panels. Yes. It's more of fun for people. Putting something into four triangles doesn't just give you better data. It's more fun for the respondent. It's, it's gamification. Fantastic. So in that meeting, I would basically be saying the target is fine, but the sense maker approach is actually making that target more operative. Right. operative. It yeah. Make, it make, it, yeah, fast feedback. It, it allow, it, the research method carries the advocacy and change initiative data with it. Yes. So you don't have to get the analysis, then persuade people, then create a communication plan. All three come together in real time. Okay, cool. Well, Dave, it's been very good uh, speaking to you. What, what does the future hold for you uh, with Cognitive Edge? Are you focusing more on employee side, NPS, or wh where are you going to now? Uh, various ways. We just set the new Centre for Applied Complexity at Bangor University. Fantastic. And I'm taking up a chair there. Um, very good. And we've created a market over the last nine years, so you'll now start to see separate organizations for MPS, for employee satisfaction, for development sector, for marketing. So effectively now we're starting to create different versions based on the core. Yeah, it's powered by SenseMaker as the brand for that. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to carry on on some of the research. I'm particularly interested in um, some of the ways in which we can create repurpose products. So mm -hmm. give you an example, in 1945 somebody noticed that chocolate bar melted in their pocket right. when they're maintaining a radar machine and we got microwave ovens. Yes. Now for every person who thought of microwave ovens, 500 people had their trousers cleaned. Mm -hmm. So we've now got techniques for that sort of small noticings and I'm going to be focusing on that a lot because both for government and for industry it's that mm -hmm. ability to repurpose existing capability for something radically new which is exciting. Fantastic. And if um, if the audience want to get in touch with you, can you give your contact details? Yeah, the website possible. is www.cognitive-edge.com and um, there's contact lists on that and anybody can get hold of us. I'm fairly easy to find on the web. Sure. And you, you do training programs as well. We've spoken a little bit about SenseMaker, but that's not yeah. consulting and training yet. Um, I think yeah, it no, it, it, it's a mixture of sense maker, but also the theory. And the next ones, I think, San Francisco and London are the next two. But details are that on the website. And we do a lot of in-house stuff. I mean, I'm, Very good. Got, I'm working with the data analytics groups, ironically, of two of the big consultancies at the moment, because they've realised the limit of data analytics. Yes. And now we're putting our stuff in as the next stage. Fantastic. Well, it's been good to speak to you, Dave. Thank you very much Thanks, for your time. Stephen. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Stephen. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.